We're constantly told that the discovery of the Higgs boson at the Large Hadron Collider was the final missing puzzle piece in the standard model. It was the only standard model particle we had not seen. It was the completion of a more than a century long journey of scientific discovery. It was the final jewel in the crown of the theory that best describes nature on the smallest of scales. However, that's not entirely accurate. At this point, you might expect me to start pointing to confined quarks or perhaps gluons, but I'm not going to. There is another particle which symmetry, theory and experimental constraints tell us must exist, but which has so far evaded capture. Another standard model particle which you may not realise that we have never directly, unambiguously observed. That particle is the tau antineutrino. Neutrinos are ghostly particles that interact incredibly weakly with matter. If you fired a beam of neutrinos at a light year of lead, half would pass through. The standard model of particle physics contains three types or flavours of neutrino, each with a corresponding antiparticle, the electron neutrino and the electron antineutrino, the muon neutrino and the muon antineutrino, and the tau neutrino and the tau antineutrino. It turns out that we have directly observed five of these six, but not, never, the elusive tau antineutrino. So how can we finally write this oversight and complete our direct observations of all the standard model antineutrinos? Well, to understand that, we first need to understand how the tau neutrino was experimentally observed. The tau neutrino was detected at the donut experiment at Fermilab in 2000. An intense beam of protons from the Fermilab Tevatron was smashed into a large block of tungsten, producing particles known as charmed mesons, including the D sub S meson, a particular favourite of mine as it was the focus of a large amount of my PhD research. D sub S mesons rapidly decay to form a tau antineutrino and a tau lepton. The tau lepton then rapidly decays, producing a tau neutrino amongst other products. The products of these decay chains are then passed through a series of magnets and 36 meters of steel shielding, which deflect away or block almost all particles, except the desired tau neutrinos. The tau neutrinos are neutral and unaffected by the magnetic field and so weakly interacting that they easily penetrate the shielding. This process creates an intense high energy beam of tau neutrinos for study. These tau neutrinos now enter the most important part of the donut experiment, the hybrid emulsion detector. The vast majority of tau neutrinos pass straight through this detector, but since the flux of neutrinos is so high, occasionally one does interact within the detector. When a tau neutrino interacts with an atomic nucleus in the detector, it creates a negatively charged tau lepton and various other charged products. These charged products can be picked up by the emulsion detector, which is composed of a repeated structure of emulsion films. A typical emulsion detector consists of silver bromide crystals with diameters of 200 nanometers dispersed in gelatin. When a charged particle traverses the emulsion, it ionizes the crystals within it, leaving a trail of ionization that can later be developed like a photographic film. Cameras can then scan the emulsion in 3D to identify dark developed grains, join them together to create tracks, and recreate the paths taken by charged particles traversing the emulsion. Such emulsions were famously exposed to cosmic radiation high on mountains and in high altitude balloons, to discover many of the charged pions and strange particles whose existence shocked elementary particle physics in the middle of the last century. Each silver halide crystal in the emulsion works as an independent charged particle detection channel. And given that there's such a high density of these particles in a typical emulsion, despite seeming relatively low tech, 
Emulsion detectors provide some of the best spatial and angular resolutions of any particle detection technology. Spatial resolutions down to about 50 nanometers. Tau neutrino interactions in such a detector are characterized by several features. The neutrino is neutral and leaves no track in the emulsion. However, when it does interact in the emulsion, it produces a charged tau lepton and various other charged products that are picked up by the emulsion and all point back to the same point in space, the point where the tau neutrino interacted with the detector. So the first telltale sign of a tau neutrino interaction in a detector is a vertex of charged particles all emanating from the same point in space that show up in the emulsion with no charge track leading into the vertex. The charged tau lepton produced in this process has an extremely short lifetime and only travels roughly one millimeter in the emulsion before decaying. Tau leptons can decay to a lighter charge lepton, an electron or muon, and two neutrinos. The lighter charge lepton is captured by the emulsion, but the two neutrinos disappear from view. So the second telltale sign of a tau neutrino interaction in a detector is a short-lived tau track that shows a pronounced kink. The kink shows the point that the tau decayed, producing a lighter charged lepton. Emulsion detectors, such as those used at Donut, have such fine spatial and angular resolution that they can capture the passage of the short-lived tau lepton and its decay. The smoking gun of a tau neutrino interaction. Using this detection methodology, the donut experiment discovered four instances of a neutrino interacting with an atomic nucleus to produce a charged tau lepton that rapidly decayed. That's the signature of a tau neutrino interaction. On July 21st, 2000, they announced the first direct evidence of tau neutrino interactions and hence the first direct detection of the tau neutrino, the third flavor of neutrino known to particle physics. So we now understand how to detect the interactions of tau neutrinos, but that raises the obvious next question. Why has nobody done this for tau antineutrinos? Why has no one made a direct observation of the tau antineutrino? Tau antineutrino should have a similar interaction with matter as a tau neutrino does. The only difference is that while a tau neutrino interaction with an atomic nucleus produces a negatively charged tau lepton, a tau antineutrino interaction produces a positively charged anti-tau lepton. However, we should still be able to detect that charged track in an emulsion detector, look for its decay kink and identify the interaction of tau antineutrinos with matter in a similar way to how Donut detected tau neutrino interactions with matter. So why has nobody done this? Well, there are two problems. Firstly, you need to create an incredibly high energy, incredibly intense beam of tau antineutrinos to capture these interactions. And secondly, you then need to be able to distinguish between tau neutrino and tau antineutrino interactions. Let's start with the first problem. Creating an incredibly intense high energy beam of tau antineutrinos is no simple feat. The beam must have an incredibly high flux and contain so many weakly interacting antineutrinos that a handful will interact with any reasonably sized detector. The antineutrinos must also have an incredibly high energy. They must have enough energy so that when they interact with the matter of a detector, they can create the rest mass of a heavy anti-tau lepton. The interaction rate of neutrinos with matter also increases with energy. So we need to pump up the energy with our beam as much as possible to make the neutrinos easier to detect. But how can we create such an intense high energy beam of tau antineutrinos? The creation of such a beam would require dedicated particle collisions. Fortunately, there is a currently operational high energy particle physics experiment that produces such beams regularly. 
the Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider is a phenomenal source of neutrinos of all flavours. When protons collide in the Atlas detector at the Large Hadron Collider, dozens of particles are produced that are strongly boosted along the beamline. Pions, kaons, hyperons, and charmed mesons. As these particles decay, they produce tightly packed beams of neutrinos and antineutrinos of all types, including an intense beam of tau antineutrinos. These beams exhibit incredibly high energies of roughly one tera electron volt due to the incredibly powerful collision energies of the Large Hadron Collider and are focused into densely packed beams, roughly 10 centimeters in diameter. Estimates suggest that LHC collisions from July 2022 to 2026 will produce trillions of neutrinos in this manner, including billions of tau antineutrinos. So it turns out that fortunately, we already have access to an incredibly intense high energy beam of tau antineutrinos. But now we hit our second problem. How can we detect these antineutrinos and show that they really are tau antineutrinos? And how can we distinguish between the interactions of tau neutrinos and tau antineutrinos to make a direct, unambiguous, definitive observation of the latter? Several experiments, such as the proposed SHIP or Search for Hidden Particles experiment at CERN, plan to chase those accomplishments. But a small, cheap, unassuming, currently operational symbiotic experiment may just get there first. An experiment known as Phaser. The beams of highly boosted particles produced by proton collisions in the Atlas experiment stream out along the tunnel of the Large Hadron Collider. Any charged particles produced are deflected and swept away by the LHC's magnets, but neutrinos and antineutrinos, as well as any other neutral particles produced, propagate unhindered. Eventually, these beams of particles meet the rock walls of the LHC tunnel as it begins to bend, and most of the particles, except neutrinos or other long-lived neutral particles we have not yet seen, are filtered out of the beams. The magnets and tunnel walls of the LHC effectively act just like the Fermilab donut, magnets and shield, filtering a messy beam of particles until it consists mostly of neutrinos and antineutrinos. And antineutrinos flood through phaser, or the forward search experiment, which is installed in a service tunnel 500 meters downstream of the proton-proton collisions underway in Atlas. Phaser is a seven meter long experiment which was installed and commissioned in 2021 with a 10 centimeter active detection radius located on the collision axis line of sight to the Atlas proton-proton collisions, maximizing the number of neutral, weakly interacting particles like neutrinos which stream through it. It is a symbiotic experiment which relies on the creation of beams of particles within another LHC experiment. Weakly interacting particles like neutrinos are lost in the noise of messy particle collisions in an experiment like Atlas. However, in a quiet LHC service tunnel, separated from those messy collisions by 500 meters of distance, 100 meters of solid rock, and powerful magnetic fields, phaser sits in a position of relative calm, just waiting to detect any weakly interacting neutral particles that can traverse the gap. Phaser sits in a perfect environment for detecting long-lived neutral particles, such as hypothetical dark photons, ALPs, and of course, neutrinos. Phaser is, for all intents and purposes, a symbiotic LHC donut experiment. However, instead of building an environment, an experiment to specifically detect tau neutrinos, phaser relies on the very structure and operation of the LHC itself to perform a similar function. And phaser 
detects neutrino interactions in a very similar style to Donut. Phaser has an initial subdetector called Phaser Nu, Phaser Neutrino, specifically designed to detect neutrinos. The Phaser Nu subdetector is composed of a repeated structure of 770 emulsion films interleaved with one millimeter thick tungsten plates to allow as many neutrinos as possible to interact within it. As we saw with Donut, this phaser new emulsion detector can detect neutrino interactions by looking for vertices of charged particles that appear in phaser new, but which display no incoming charge tracks. Indeed, in August 2023, Phaser became the first experiment ever to detect high energy neutrinos coming directly from a collider experiment and interacting in another experiment. And just like Donut, Phaser will be able to detect tau neutrino interactions by detecting a neutrino interaction followed by a short lived tau track that kinks upon decay. However, Phaser is now being blasted with a huge number of tau antineutrinos. And it should now be able to detect interaction of those tau antineutrinos with the phaser detector. So we now have an incredibly intense high energy beam of tau antineutrinos. And we also have an operational donut-like experiment complete with emulsion subdetectors that can detect the interactions of those tau anti-neutrinos. We're getting there. However, we still have one problem to overcome. If both tau neutrinos and tau anti-neutrinos are interacting within phaser nu, how do we distinguish between tau neutrino and tau anti-neutrino interactions and perform a definitive, unambiguous detection of a tau anti-neutrino interaction? As we have seen, when a tau neutrino interacts within a matter detector, it creates a vertex of charged particles emanating from the same point in space, but with no track leading into it. And then a short-lived tau lepton track that shows a pronounced kink. When a tau antineutrino interacts with a matter detector, it creates a similar vertex of charged particles emanating from the same point in space, but with no track leading into it. And also a short-lived anti-tau lepton track that shows a pronounced kink. To an emulsion detector, these two signals are completely identical. An emulsion detector only produces tracks that map the direction charged particles flew. It cannot distinguish whether that particle was positively charged or negatively charged, whether a track was created by a tau lepton or a tau anti-lepton. Given that this is the only marked difference between the interactions of a tau neutrino and a tau antineutrino with matter, an emulsion detector alone cannot distinguish tau neutrino interactions from tau antineutrino interactions. And without that discrimination, we cannot reach a direct observation of the tau antineutrino. In order to separate the interactions, we need a way of determining the charge, positive or negative, of the tau lepton produced during a neutrino interaction. In particle physics experiments, the sign of the charge of a particle is determined by having that particle traverse a known magnetic field perpendicular to the particle's direction of flight. If the particle bends in one direction, it has a positive charge. If it bends in the other direction, it has a negative charge. However, applying this idea to the tau lepton or anti-lepton is very tricky. The tau has an incredibly short lifetime and travels an incredibly short distance before decaying. That makes it very difficult to bend its track enough to clearly determine its charge. How then can we determine the charge of a tau lepton produced in a neutrino interaction? The key is to look at the decay products of the tau. As we have seen, the tau lepton can decay to a muon and two neutrinos, which disappear from view and create a distinctive tau to muon kink. To conserve charge, negative tau leptons produced in tau neutrino interactions decay to negative muons. But by contrast, 
positive anti-tau leptons produced in tau anti-neutrino interactions decay to form positive anti-muons. Muons are extremely penetrating and long-lived and travel a much longer distance before decaying than tau leptons do. That means that we can accurately determine the direction they curve in a magnetic field and determine their charge. If we can do this, we can work back up the decay chain conserving charge and determine whether the initial interaction was that of a tau neutrino or tau antineutrino. To perform this measurement of a muon's curvature, the phaser nu emulsion detector is linked up to the main phaser experiment via an interface of silicon pixel tracking layers. Tracks in the emulsion detector are linked up to curved charged particle tracks in the phaser spectrometer by matching multiple tracks between the emulsion and interface detector in terms of position and angle. The phaser spectrometer then contains a powerful magnetic field that curves the muon and can determine its charge. Through charge conservation, we then know the charge of the tau lepton that produced the muon and whether the initial interaction in phaser that produced the tau lepton was with a tau neutrino or a tau antineutrino. We're now there. We have the ability to separate the interactions of tau neutrinos and tau antineutrinos. So if an experiment like phaser has the ability to separate out interactions of tau neutrinos from tau antineutrinos and make a direct detection of the tau antineutrino, why hasn't it done it yet? Indeed, Phaser has already begun discussing separating neutrino and antineutrino interactions in this fashion. Well, the simple answer to this problem is time and statistics. Given the high mass of the tau lepton, less tau neutrinos are created in collisions at the Large Hadron Collider than electron neutrinos or muon neutrinos. That leaves fewer tau neutrinos and antineutrinos for Phaser to detect. The interaction rate of tau neutrinos and antineutrinos with the nuclei of detectors is also suppressed relative to those of electron and muon neutrinos and antineutrinos. That means that fewer tau neutrinos and antineutrinos interact inside any experiment. Add that all together and Phaser only expects to see a tiny handful of tau neutrino and antineutrino interactions during several years of LHC proton collisions. And it hasn't yet reported any of these interactions since data taking began in 2022. What's more, once these interactions do occur within phaser, they have to be found amongst far more frequent electron and muon neutrino interactions. As we have seen, the tau lepton that gives away a tau neutrino interaction is incredibly fleeting and difficult to capture. In addition, as we've seen, we then need to distinguish whether an interaction involved a tau neutrino or tau antineutrino. The tau lepton has to decay to a muon whose charge can be determined, and only 18% of tau leptons decay to muons. The upshot of all of this is that the direct detection of the tau antineutrino, rather than being technologically out of reach, has now become a waiting game. The direct detection of the tau antineutrino at phaser or any other similar experiment requires the capture of a subset of a subset of neutrino interactions. Phaser simply hasn't seen these interactions or at least reported them yet. However, phaser has only been taking data since July 2022, a period in which operation and analysis techniques still had to be dialed in. During the rest of the LHC's run three, Phaser expects to see 10 times as much data, and perhaps we will finally be able to capture the Holy Grail, an unambiguous tau antineutrino interaction. Of course, Phaser isn't the only horse in the race to directly observe the tau antineutrino for the first time. Other experiments like SHIP the Search for Hidden Particles beam dump experiment at CERN are also racing to find it and insist that they will. 
The ship experiment will boast a similar emulsion target to phase and new, but will be equipped with tracking and magnetic charge determination within that emulsion. They also anticipate huge fluxes of tau antineutrinos produced by a dedicated beam dump design and insist that they will be able to definitively separate tau neutrinos and antineutrinos for the first time. Perhaps, despite beginning operations behind Phaser, they will be better positioned to sprint to the finish line. The specifics of ship are a fascinating topic for another time. But regardless of which experiment gets there first, the bottom line is that the direct detection of the tau antineutrino will soon be made. There are no more technological roadblocks. It's just a matter of time. So we now see that the discovery of the Higgs boson was technically not the final missing puzzle piece of the standard model, but rather the piece that many feared might not be in the box. The direct observation of the tau antineutrino would complete the direct detection of every standard model lepton. And a beautiful realization is that the experiments that are primed to make this detection will not only close off a loophole in the theory that outlines our understanding of the universe on the smallest scales, but will simultaneously help us to explore and constrain the future. A parameter landscape of Alps, dark photons, and other long-lived, weakly interacting particles. Tidying up the last corners of the standard model need not be a chore, but a potential bridge to what comes next. I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.